it's so nice to have a small cozy gathering because usually it's in room 300 and we are sort of spaced out. But I always feel this room brings about energies which are not usual. Um, and I'm so happy that those who are really interested in the subject are here, particularly honored that Mr. A.K. Gupta, Mrs. Gupta, and their daughter, Arundhati, can be here today. Um, there's a small Canadian connection with Harish and I, and that they are in Mon Montreal. Um, big thank you, first, to Mona Sengupta and Sushruta Shorkar. They have been the key that opened the lock to Mr. Urun Gupto. <clears throat> I was very, um, I was very privileged to be at the launch of Mr. Gupta's book, which we're going to be talking about today. And what I found was that it is multi-dimensional. There's Professor Choitali Moitro here, Mrs. Anju Munshi, Mrs. Anusuriya Paul, and the author who's going to be in conversation, Mr. Un Kumar Gupta. I'm Julie Banerjee Mehta, for those of you who haven't met. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our monthly book launches. <coughs> Shemunti Shengupto is our librarian and uh, really is a great driving force to get these events organized. Shivanti, is this our 41st or 42nd? 42nd. Please come in, please. Mrs. Katan, do come in. Make yourself comfortable. So, without further ado, on behalf of the Bengal Club, the Bengal Club's library subcommittee, and the enthusiastic team of book club members, some of whom are here today, and all of you, I would like to say a few words in preface before we have our conversation, at the end of which you will all be invited to come in and join the fray. So the book would appear, The Treasures of the Sun God, would appear to be a book on mythology or legends or the history or the politics of history. I think once you begin to get into the narrative, you realize that somewhere it is also a love story, it is also a mystery, and it is also a tale that constantly goes backwards and forwards in time. And like many postmodernist writers, Mr. A.K. Gupto is actually an engineer by training. IIT, no less, and IIM, no less. The architecture of his narrative is therefore somewhat different to the narrative that we read from the usual cachet that we come across. Booker Prize winners, Nobel Prize winners, you know, the entire lot. And this is where I think I go back to my years of teaching at the University of Toronto where young students took my elective course. One of the courses was Asian Cultures and Literatures in Canada, that is Asian Cultures by Asians who wrote and who were at the top of the food chain when it came to literary writing, mainly fiction is what I taught. Incredibly, it was chemical engineering students, students from civil engineering, students from physics, urban geography, who came to fiction with a very different force. I think the architecture of this novel is very cleverly done. It starts with a couple who've been married and want to go to Kunarik for a holiday. And underneath the surface, there is a kind of pull and tug almost of the tide. And in this way, the formalism reflects the geography of Puri. So all of us who are interested in Konarak, for me, what drew me 
to this book was when I came to a part, and I think, Anju, you will be discussing Bhai Ravi, right? Bhai Ravi. So, in the study of the Durga Shaptoshi, which is the beginning of our tantric ideas of the Devi, different parts of this narrative will appeal to different readers. And this is, I think, what the richness of the book is all about. There's mythology, there is history, there is multiculture, which existed far, far in the past, where you had European travelers coming to this place, which was visited, revisited, from the seventh century onwards. There's Tantra, as I said, there's legend, there's myth, you know, there's something for everyone. But it's also a mystery in many ways. And this is what I hope we can unpackage today for all of you. And then of course, seven o'clock comes the bell and we would have to, because this is also being recorded and also on hybrid, so I think the hybrid guys will have to leave us for another function in the club, but we can continue our conversation after seven, as long as you want to stay. So come join the ride. So the first question I would like to ask you, uh, Mr. Gupta, what made you, I know you've been to Puri so many times, and it's a place which has stayed in your psyche forever, and then of course you went back again and again. What is it about the beginnings of this book? How did it come about for a physicist and for a, for a scientist? Well, I have visited Puri many, many times, and since my childhood, and even since my childhood, I used to go with my parents and see this Konark temple. Initially, I didn't understand what is good about it. People come here, actually people come to Puri for Jagannath temple. People come to Bhuvanesha for Shiva temple. But what is that in Konark temple, nobody says. Now, the first time I came, you, I do not know whether you have seen it as uh, early as I did, but there are debris, debris all around the corner temple, and there are figures and figurines lying on the sand. And they were beautifully carved. So every time I came there, I kept on finding out what is the good things about this uh, figurines and who did that. Now there is a difference between Konak Temple and the Puri Jagannath Temple, because I think Puri Jagannath Temple is well known to everybody. You go to Puri Jagannath Temple, you, you do not see these figurines. You see the temple structure, which is the Shikara, and you see the Jagmohan, where you can sit in Puri Temple, Jagannath Temple, and you can view Jagannath Balaram and Subhatra. The Shikara, or the main temple, was not there in Konak. The only Jagmohan is there, and before the Jagmohan there is a Nata Mandir, where the cultural events are done. But this Jagmohan in Konak temple is filled with artifacts is filled with figurines, and is filled with the type of lives they lived in those days. Now, if you go back and start 
looking into the history of the Konark temple, you will find a few things. The Konark temple was developed or created by the illustrious king of Orissa, Narasimha Deva. And Narasimha Deva, why did he go and develop a temple to worship sun? When originally the South Indian culture was to worship Shiva, and then slowly they are coming to Vishnu. Why did he want to develop a temple? dedicated to sun. So I found out that Narsimha Deva, he, when he really became emperor, his father gave him the kingdom, he took the name Langula Narsimha Deva, which means he must be having a tail. And the tail may be a physical anomaly that he had, and he had to get out of that. He was one of the most illustrious kings of Orissa. And to find out why he, how he should come out of this. If you go much uh, further back, you will find that Lord Krishna's son, Shambhu, he was infected with an incurable disease. And Lord Krishna <laughs> wanted him to pray to son. Now, there was a sun idol also, which was normally kept in Puri Jagannath temple. So it is possibly appropriate to think that Narsimha Deva wanted to pay homage to the sun to get rid of his physical anomaly. And this is how he prayed to the uh, Sun Lord. There is another very important thing to watch. Orissa, which was Kalinga at that time, never fought against other <laughs> cultures to enhance their territory. The Kalachuris were constantly attacking them. He defeated Kalachuris, but he made Kalachuri king's son to marry his daughter. Uh, so that and understanding is reached to protect each other. So did Narasimha Deva. The only once when he really had a war against Banga, because Banga was also constantly trying to get Kalinga. And cross. He needed the artisans in gold to come and decorate the Jagmohan of the Kornak temple. Now, these are the two historical events that amazed me. And then I tried to find out how this temple was built. 
द टेम्पल शिकारा द मेन टेम्पल वॉज इवन हायर देन पुरी जगन्नाथ टेम्पल एंड द काशी एंड भुवनेश्वर टेम्पल ना वेन ही ट्राई टू डू दैट ही डिड दैट इन एन एरिया हुच इज वेरी नियर द सी so any structure which weighs that much will go down and as the temple was being built the temple didn't last for long the temple just collapsed uh in the sand Uh, it is there in the history that bishu uh, maharana was the chief architect of orissa and he developed or created the uh, temples architecture but bishu's son dharmapada always said that the normal architecture of a temple will not be able to withstand the sand based soil so when the temple collapsed dharmapada possibly gave the idea of magnetic to use magnetic rocks so that the gravity will pull the temple down and the magnetic rocks will pull the temple up this is how the temple was built it is a brilliant concept and no other place in india has used this concept at all i i think uh, dr gupta um i think the only other place that i have gone to visit and which tried the technique was the temple of somnath okay i haven't been there but must be uh, very interesting yeah. because when uh, mohammad of ghori i think it was not yeah. ghazni came to uh, you know take over that temple 13th early 13th late 12th century they couldn't figure out how the shivalingas were just hanging in the air just yeah. like in your book and they finally I think it was some Hindu architects like Dhammapada mm. who came and said look there's a magnetic pull of such velocity and such precision that is keeping the shivalingams yeah. in place so um taking it from there if i might actually turn <coughs> turn to anju um and ask you anju you know i was very moved when um lingaya was having uh, his first experience of love and love making right yes. um with ambika amba amba and Ambarika. the pain physical pain that he suffered at the moment of consummation and the beautiful description of that by mr gupta drove me to find out why he was going to the bhairavi even more and that's where i think anju you might be able to throw some light on one aspect of the book which is you know electric thank you so much um i think um for me the most impactful portion of the book was bhairavi she uh, moved me and to be very honest when i started the book i thought it was like one of those documentaries and you know uh, with too many temples kings and queens palaces invasions and things like that so i started losing a little bit of interest and as the story progressed i realized how mistaken i was how mistaken i was because there was so much to it it was so multidimensional from one to the other till i reached the story of bhairavi and narsimha i i felt 
Bhairavi made him accept himself the way he was. She, Bhairavi would be a, a synonym for seduction, charm, energy and power, and extremely empowered. So I, Bhairavi's uh, and Narsimha's consummation of love, I think, kind of ensured that he accepted himself the way he is. It helped him uh, understand his limitations, his weaknesses, and to ex uh, accept them. And because of that, I think he promoted himself from an ordinary mortal to somebody who had the power to rule the masses with his, with his um, newly gained uh, belief in himself and a newly gained uh, uh, you know, power that he wielded on a person like uh, Bhairavi. So I, in description of Bhairavi, I like the way you described her red eyes, her complexion. I think you are the master of the art of visualization, you know, which I, which I the way you visualize even a floating cloud and um, you know a mass of wood or a mass of stone or I mean you can even um, visualize the fragrance in the air you know that's your power I personally feel that's uh, a kind of a creative gift which you have and that is a tremendous art of visualization so the pages I skipped in the beginning I think by the end of the book I went back and I read them again you know so <laughs> So let me quickly turn to uh, Choitali, uh, who is always very good at uh, locating uh, the narrative and giving us an overview. Choitali, what did you take away from the book? First of all, a big thank you and good evening. Thank you, Julie. Di. I feel extremely honored to share this day with uh, Mr. Arun Gupta. Well, the book, I think, is compressed with knowledge. If I could compare it with a sort of uh, pearl string, which can be laid on this table, each pearl is actually tangentially getting linked up with a world of knowledge, which we just touch and if we want, we can keep exploring. So the most important point which uh, I thought of talking to you about, sir, is how did you compress so much of narrative, include mythology, include history and actually your narrative although linear is actually going from history to historicity mythology to myth and from person to some sort of liberation i think you're not talking about individuals anu and every other character it gets reduced to a speck in front of the knowledge world that you are opening excellent detachment i think thank you at the same at the same time, uh, Anju, Anasuya, and Choitali, I felt that at the end of the day, this is a book about love. This is a book about love which uh, Mr. Gupta traces from uh, Lingula to um, Anu and to Orno and to Madi and to Kuntala, Kunti. So um, in that connection, uh, Anusuya, what do you find which is spiritual but at the same time sacred and the profane intersecting all the time? And may I just include a welcome to um, Vinod, Mr. Vinod Pillay is here, Dr. Paramita Mukherjee Malik is here, and um, Anugupta is here. Very, very warm welcome to all of you. So Anasuya, do tell us what you thought was uh, this wonderful intersection of love which was profane and love which was sacred. Thank you, Julie, and good evening to all of you. Uh, it's a privilege to have read this book, uh, Dr. Gupta, and I must say I really enjoyed it. Um, taking uh, over from what uh, Julie and uh, Anju and uh, Choitali have said, um, I was really very, very intrigued by all the ancient knowledge of temple building that you explained over here. And 
uh, it's always you know like uh, very very interesting to know how they uh, built because it's the same curiosity that goes into the way the pyramids were built and here they are talking of magnetic rocks which were placed one on top of another we are seeing the ruins but we know in the design there was a dome which was also magnetic how in those days did they manage to lift a dome and place it on that <coughs> that given how did the portuguese even dislodge it from there given that magnetism was holding the structure together so it's an extremely interesting area of uh, scientific knowledge that was uh, very well known to the people of that time and they as a reference went into ancient hindu temple building to use as a template to structure this so we have the we are in modern day life looking at a medieval structure which has based its knowledge on ancient structure so it makes me connect many dots you know about temples in india in general like uh, as earlier i was telling you that uh, in uh, tirupati i had been many times but on one occasion i felt like my legs were not moving comfortably on the ground of tirupati and i felt like something pulling me down even as i was climbing the steps and on further inquiry from someone who's very uh, devout and goes to tirupati often i learned that there is something called the janakarshak yantra and the dhanakarshak yantra which were placed in the foundation by the adi shankaracharya prior to the building of the temple so the amount of knowledge of geometry its power it's uh, the vectors involved you know when they uh, and the application of it you've researched on that aspect and shown us this uh, research of this temple so uh, that was something that i was very very uh, attracted by in this book and uh, i like the way you merged it with uh, modern history another very different aspect of your book which really triggered my curiosity was the under sea uh, equipment the mini subs because as all of you will remember in last year's uh, the fiasco that uh, happened with uh, the titan which went down and imploded at uh, 13000 feet uh, it was again extreme tourism to explore the titanic and we are looking at this book perhaps also as something to promote uh, tourism in india so <laughs> if we were to go in in odisha and so we will have to look at a lot of uh, yeah um, uh, different ways to monitor this sort of uh, dangerous tourism <laughs> what i think is a quite uh, you know uh, opportune uh, by the author has been the way that he has hooked different readers yes. right different readers with different, different interests things, yes. get you know absolutely the world of knowledge and as i said this is what intrigues me when i've looked at the way engineers come to literature it is a very different uh kind of approach the spaces that are in the book for instance i'll just read out a little in a minute but i wanted you all to tell me uh, before we turn to the author when you describe the space in the marketplace when you describe the space which is so temporary of the acceptance of ma ganga into the dreadlocks of shiva that space each space has its own characteristic yes. and this is really possible i think by a scientific mind uh, and and you know all kudos to you so would you like to just talk a little bit about how you um, how you envisaged how you created of geography okay. in, this, in this book once i found out that it is possible it, it is technically possible to create a high uh, end structure with uh, magnetic uh, uh, stones then the question comes why does this magnetic stones come 
Okay, we know again historically uh, Rome, Roman traders have always been for a very, very long time, around 6th century, 7th century, doing India, doing <laughs> trades with India. Now, if that is true, then maybe these magnetic stones were brought in from somewhere in Europe, but it is not possible. Because all those ships, they will be using iron kind of uh, material to develop it. So these magnetic stones must have been in India and must have been in India around Konar, which means that any ship that comes to Konar will be pulled and will be destroyed. So this is how I started the first, just to give the idea of these magnetic stones can be there somewhere. Now, once you establish that, then the rest of the things are falling into place because if many ships were destroyed, then many reaches were also there. Where are those reaches? Now, once you know that reaches are there, then you will try to find those reaches. And to find those reaches under the sea, you have to take the help of modern technology. The sub, uh, the mini sub that I uh, referred to, is it is an actual mini sub which is being manufactured by a company in Vancouver. And those are not very expensive. So those things can be used even for many resorts near the sea. You can go down, you, you, you can see uh, whatever is under the sea, and you can come out. Now, this is not the only sub that is being made. There are very, very uh, detail-oriented subs that are being manufactured in the United States, which can go up to 1,000 meters down. And it, it can take 15 to 16 people in a sub. And it is not the normal submarine that you use for war. It can be used for many other things. So one of uh, our... Uh, the people who are trying to find the reaches, they are using those kinds of subs and just by uh, fluke, I would say, mm -hmm. Maddie could find out that there is a place yes. and this, yeah, Yes, yes. If I might cut in for a second, yeah. and this is where I think the reader is so surprised because you use that scientific technique that uh, Madhav is so good at, yes. right? Madhi is so good at, to show that his long lost love, Kunti, Kunti. doesn't want to let him go yeah. into that submarine because she knows how dangerous it is. And she says to us, that I lost you once, I don't want to lose you again. And I think this is where you have brought the immediacy and the urgency of science. And what can go wrong? Nothing is guaranteed. So you bring the spiritual, the religious, into what is for us the reality of science. And this is where I think as, as an author, you excel because you bring two binaries into a beautiful intersection. Choitali, what would you say? I would, uh, I would definitely uh, sort of extend your question and would 
please like to ask mr gupta that when you had been uh, sort of uh, conceiving the plot you have said in places about three temples with different degrees of importance and for us the average people we would uh, have one particular mindset when we go to jagannath temple another mindset for lingaraj temple but definitely not the same mindset for konark temple so what actually played in your mind to differentiate konark would you be able to write a mysterious story centering the jagannath temple or the lingaraj temple because we know that uh, uh, there is a place i'm sure we all of us know just let me remind you that there is a place where three fingers are sort of uh, the fingerprints are seen in the puri temple where mahaprabhu had mm. stood at one time and he did not traverse the front because 600 shivalingas were there underneath so this them. this sort of intuitiveness that you find in the architecture in the placing in the bearing of this temple how would that differentiate with the konark temple how did it come to your mind if i could ask please i think the uh, konark temple apart from being a temple it kept on showing what was the type of lives people lived which was not there in lingaraj temple or in jagannath temple but there are mysteries in jagannath temple i do not know much about lingaraj temple there are mysteries because there are riches yes. unfathomable riches lying in jagannath temple very few people know where and very people few people can dare to even look at them now i have been very lucky because one of the mohantis of jagannath temple uh, his uh, this mohanti was very young mohanti very handsome guy unbelievable and he took me to a closed gate and it is gate made of stones he said the the riches jagannath riches are inside this mm. but there are only very few people who can go inside that because the place is filled with cobras yes yeah, because because that, that is supposed to be the sanctum sanctotum yeah. which is not open for any kind of excavation yeah. i just want to turn our attention a little bit to the size style of writing and uh what struck i think what struck many of us who read the book is the precision which uh mr gupta is very particular about the city overlooked the sea and the port of mamalai its most important port over the years the king had developed facilities of the port that helped the city of mamalapuram to establish trades mostly by sea with romans chinese the far east and other indian kingdoms roman ships frequently sailed from misr egypt to mamalapuram and then to lanka and southeast asia traders from far away places had come to join the celebrations of shivaratri one of them was the roman trader marcus corionus marcus had been trading with the pallava king for the past 15 years he had developed large boulders of granite which the king used for building temples palaces and sculptures the king had observed that erosion on granite was much less pronounced than it was on soapstone which had been used to build temples in the past you managed to connect this very well with the modern day corporate which is who is also from italy so you know the connections between time past and time present are so quick 
like quicksilver that you, for a minute, you lose count of whether you're here or whether you're there, which makes it seamless. You know that history is being repeated. The trading history of India with the West, the spice route, the trading history of India with Southeast Asia is also very well articulated here. Now, I think automatically what comes to mind is the research that went into this book, from history to mythology to legend, to your actually going, as you say, and visiting these places of spiritual uh, greatness. How long did it take you from your conception of the book to the end of the book? Mrs. Gupta <laughs> and your daughters accept that you must have been really immersed into it. No? Into it. Uh, it was 15 months of very solid It was 15 months of very solid work. That's, uh, that's very yeah. Yeah. 15 months. That's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. In those 15 <laughs> months, I used to work as if I was working in an office. I used to work for eight to ten hours a day, and she will always, uh, my wife will always help me bringing the tea. Um, uh, sometimes I would sit down and I would think how to connect them. Uh, now, Mamallapuram, uh, you must have gone there, many of you yes, must have gone there, it is Mahabalipuram. Yes. And actually, in these days, when I was young, it was, it used to be written Mahavalipuram. Now they are writing Mamallapuram. Yeah, no, and there's yeah. a lot of evidence that ships from Mamallapuram oh, went yes. to Cambodia. Yes. So in our research yes. in Cambodia, the Pallavi script mm -hmm. is a part of the... Right. So, Mamallapuram, uh, part of the history, I think it is well known. Just you have to put it in a form mm. which can be easily read by uh, people who are reading a novel rather than reading a history book. And the end, I will just come straight at the end when you will find that this, the uh, Roman traders, uh, I mean, Descendant. Uh, yeah, I, I, this Roman trader itself will be able uh, or was able to give what can be best done in this kind of complex situation. If you think, this Roman businessman or, or Italian businessman, mm. he's not happy that he couldn't gather those riches. He wants to find another way of getting into yes. it. Yes. And people will keep on doing that because people know that riches are there. And some of the riches, like this particular man, he feels it is his own because it was gifted to him. So he has all the right to get into that. So um, Marcus Cornius, Marcus I think you've also shown the multicultural ethos that was under King Yes, yes, and that, Narasimha Barman. Yeah, so from there, uh, if I can just turn to another scientist here, who is also a poet, who's listening to us, uh, Dr. Paramita Mukherjee Malik. Paramita, lovely to have you here with us. Your, uh, Hello. Lovely. Yes. Lovely. Paramita, yes. What's, your, what's your take on the book? And you always have so many aspects. So please go ahead 
I'll uh, just take two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Julie Deep. Uh, sorry, please pardon my exuberance. I just loved the book, loved the book. It's such a mix of mystery and history. You know, the mix of mystery and history made it so very interesting. And the biggest take, I, I will be with Anushua, uh, Anju, sorry, Anjuji, when she said the Bhairavi, you know, the Bhairavi was the strength for the king. And the king was a very sensible king, Narasimha Deva. And I loved it when he said, he told his father, when I'm going to be king, I have to be named King Langula Narasimha Deva. And that, I think, is the biggest take for me in this book, that if anybody has any deformity, any fault, he or she should accept it, you know. That insecurity, when you put it up and open, then your insecurity goes away. When everybody knows your weakness, it's like you can talk about your weakness, you can talk about your deformity. I think you get tremendous strength, and he got tremendous strength which made him a very good king. Otherwise, I don't think he would he would be such an illustrious king. And and of course, the book is amazing, sir. Uh, it is amazing. It's a wonderful read. It's an absolute unput downable book. I was just totally engrossed. And thank you so much for writing such a wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Paramita. So um, anyone else? Uh, anu Gupta? Uh, G Gini, Mrs. Ginny Sen, Mrs. Ginny Sen. Would Hi, you... this is uh, this is Anu Gupta. Can you hear me? Yes, Anu. Please go ahead. So uh, I'm Arun Gupta's daughter. I'm uh, dialing in from London, actually. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's just I. I um, it, it's very wonderful to see so many people acknowledging Baba's book and discussing it in so much depth. Uh, I think we all lived uh, the book while Baba was writing it. You know, we were all very much a part of, uh, you know, the the story being developed. Um, but it, it gives us great joy to see that other people uh, are reading the book and loving it as much as we did. I always told Baba that he he has written a brilliant, brilliant book. Um, but it's very heartening to see all of you enjoying it and loving it as much as we do. Thank you for that, Anu. Um, can we ask you, can you? Can we push you a little harder? And I will be pushing Arundhati in a minute. But can I push you a little harder and say... Um, are you a science uh, student as well? Are you in the sciences? Yes. Yes. So was it a bit of a surprise to you that here was a man who you looked up to, uh, had done so well in IIT, then IIM, and then he taught and he, you know, worked as a scientist, as an engineer. Did it surprise you that he managed to straddle the worlds of science as well as literature? Not at all. Not at all. And I'll tell you why. It's because my dad is an extremely, extremely accomplished man. And I know that he won't touch anything unless he knows that he'll excel at it. So it didn't surprise me at all. Um, it, it amazed me. The book still continues to astonish and astound me uh, with its brilliance. I think Many more people need to read it because it's such a wonderful story. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I just hope Baba finds in him the energy and the, you know, the enthusiasm to write another one. I love his books. I find that you are, uh, you know, able to pick up on uh, little details which might go unnoticed for us. What else about the story? If we move away a little bit from history and mythology and come into the stylistics of the writing, I think in the second part of our conversation now, um, what do you find which works and what do you find might have been better? Um, like I mentioned before, his art of visualization is a very strong feature 
It is, uh, I remember somebody who long time back said that um, when I write about somebody, I live with that person. So it got me thinking and I asked him, but how do you live with the person if the person is dead and gone? He said, I read about him and then I visualize him with certain expressions. I visualize him with certain dialogues and it's like living with that person and then I write about it. And many people have read about person A, person B, but my reading is a little different because I visualize much more than what people visualize. In um, the author's work, I think I could see that streak, a very strong streak of creative visualization. I, you had to stick to historical facts. You did not uh, destroy the historical facts, but having held on to them, you also improvised the sentiments and the sensitivity of different characters and personas that you created. You made them extremely likable, endearing by way of their expressions, by way of what they thought about each other. Like you said, there are two, uh, three, uh, no, two love stories. I think there were four love stories. There was Amba and there was, there was Bhairavi and there was Anu Arnab and there was Madi and his Kunti. So each one had um, a different way of expressing their love. Very unique, very different, some possessive, some very giving, some very willing to give, some very willing to share. So this is the, the writer's license, I think, which you used to your fullest advantage, having stuck to the historical facts. Your narrative has been simple, your art of visualization, your very strong point, and uh, we loved it all. Thank you. I think we have to just turn uh, from the hybrid mode to the one-on-one -on -one recording mode. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back in a second as soon thank as we you. sort out the techniques. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so um, I will I will pass on uh, the mic to Choitali, Dr. Choitali Moitro. I was, I was just going to sort of continue what Anju had been saying that about four love stories. Uh, one important aspect of the narration is that uh, Mr. Gupta is able to infuse life into the day-to-day -day living and then bring in a little bit of history and sort of create a very clever collage of his uh, narration, which enriches the feeling that we are reading a story, story to which we belong, story to which we learn from history, and the story which might happen. There are certain pockets in the book which has a sense of probability. I think that builds up, and it is this, this, I mean, Rola Barthes comes to my mind, but uh, that apart, it is this probability motif which uh, just doesn't take us uh, not to the end of the book, but definitely we, we feel that I wish something else like something similar had been written, some other part of the world. So proud to feel that in Urisa, there is so much to learn and so much to get connected with the elemental presence of the sea. The sea is a very big metaphor. Yes. Anusuya, would you like to take it from there? So again, uh, the book was uh, actually more close to my heart because uh, I have spent a great part of my childhood visiting uh, Odisha and uh, going to uh, Lingaraja temple and uh, traveling down to Puri, Jagannath and then driving up to Konarak temple. Although now after reading your book, my memory is more appreciative than how I was when I actually saw the temple. And I'm beginning to think I need to revisit that I temple. Have to go we should. And of course, I mean, uh, the picturesque beauty of the beach drive all the way from Puri to Konarak. It's an extraordinary beach ride. And uh, maybe you could come up with a sequel with uh, many more mysteries that can be, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> taken out from mother, this. Mother will find some more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, don't forget what I took away from the book, and I'd love you to tell me if I was wrong or right, the author sitting right here, 
the treasures of the sun god which appear to be material treasures of gold and of precious stones and of beautiful artifacts is not really the treasure we should be taking away it's the treasure of spirituality yes absolutely yeah. absolutely I, just, i would just like to add that you had been talking about the mohanti so may i just add that as i have heard right from my childhood i have been to the jagannath temple uh, more than 30 times but still i feel there is such a lot of mystery because it respects every being around mm. there is a sort of local saying keu bhuke thake na so feeding everyone is also one form of understanding treasure if i'm not mistaken yes, and the mohanti the senior most mohanti who is supposed to uh, close and tie his eyes and put the emerald on jagannath doesn't live for long they don't have the human body existing so whatever the treasures mean i'm reminded of the statue of athena mm. which was plundered and the feet is still preserved in the museum of athens you find that it is a human feet but the meaning that it gives out it exudes is not human it is superhuman superhuman okay turning a little bit uh, to our listeners and our readers uh, first i will I, i mean this is such an opportunity we hardly get an opportunity to get the family of the author and such an illustrious man so first uh, shubhoshree madam will you tell us a little about your experience and he wrote this while he was in canada yes so it was really a memory recall yes. and did he come and visit india many times yeah we came to india every year and he we, he was very keen to visit puri mm -hmm. uh, and all those places uh, he was very much deeply interested in history and every time he went there he researched came home what he wrote i don't know because i was not there but i am the first person who read the whole manuscript it's okay it's okay i am the f i am the first person to read the whole book on our drive from montreal to toronto toronto to montreal i should read it because that's the only time i got both of us were sitting together i should read tell him that this is you know this is where you have to correct this is where you are okay so that's how uh, yeah so you had an unpaid editor and i'm lucky i have an unpaid editor you yes. you know there's no beating a really good editor who doesn't yeah. Yeah. doesn't okay urupati his daughter um i think it, the one thing i want to mention that baba's probably forgotten is that he started writing this book soon after he retired and baba's baba ma they they've been givers all their lives and for baba to suddenly not have something to give back was a struggle he was struggling with retirement and we kept saying baba you work so hard take a break you know and at that point he started writing this book um and i i know there's a lot of uh discussion about how he came about with this uh plot and how he wrote the story how he structured the story and all i can say i'm not underplaying the genius of the story because it is absolutely genius but i think he was just inspired yes. you know because the muse was with him. yes Puri was his um you know love destination from his childhood a lot of good memories with his family with his parents his siblings and he's taken mom there as well i think we've been once when we were kids but i've i've not seen sun temple um but it is something that is very close to his heart baba is an avid reader so he he reads a lot he stores a lot of it inside so this the fact that he could write the book in 15 months is because all the research was not done just because of that book it was a lot of knowledge that he has acquired over the years and there were new things that he was of obviously exploring you know like the submarine and things like that so those were new research points for that's him that's where he excels absolutely absolutely that's where he excels and and i think one of you mentioned it the way he has kind of intertwined history with fiction is what i love because i i always find it difficult when people mess with history to tell their story because it's very difficult for youngsters who are learning history or who are trying to learn about certain things to get these different versions right. 
that are incorrect. So I, I'm really happy about that. And um, it was my privilege to be dad's proofreader. Yes. <laughs> I, was, I was working in Sydney at that time, so there was a time difference. So he would send things before he went to bed and I would have the rest of the day to proofread and go back to him. And um, you know, Baba always told us that you girls have uh, studied in English medium, you are such good, uh, you've got such good grasp of the language and uh, he's shown us that actually he's the one with the good grasp of the language. Thank you, Thank you Arundhati. Resident historian, Dr. Harish Mehta, what is your opinion, taking it from Arundhati, the merging of history with fiction? That seems to be the way postmodern literature is going, right? So would you care to say a few words? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think <clears throat> um, a, a good novelist must never let history get in the way of a story. And uh, you can take all the uh, liberties with history because history, according to some theorists, is a pack of lies anyway. Uh, what we learn of history is not some great uh, oracle. But you know, as we all know, it's written on the basis of documents and many of these documents are incorrect tainted, you know, one-sided, so, you know, what can come out of them? So, I mean, I congratulate anyone, uh, and especially you, I mean, if, you, if you've taken liberties with history. And uh, so, yeah, and I think uh, a, a lot of uh, universities are teaching literature, uh, history, history courses uh, always have a couple of novels as part of uh, the course component and they usually have that and they make the students review write a review of that book and you know linking it up with actual historical events so i think your book is right out there right up there thank you we have several writers here first shumita di shumita banerji who's uh, you know an, a novelist of some repute now with two, three books. And uh, would you like Thank to you. talk a little bit about uh, how you, I mean, whether you've read the book or not, what you've gathered? For me, Odessa has always been the place that we've been to. <laughs> and very recently, we went to Konarak Temple. And, um, and we saw the sound and light and the history that, that was narrated there. So having listened to the story and having, you know, got a little bit of a glimpse of, uh, of what the book is about, it is certainly something that I would, you know, want to look at again in, in terms of reading the book and looking deeper into the story. And uh, sort of matching fiction and, um, and history, you know, trying to, as Anju said, living with the characters is something, it's almost like following the characters and trying to see what they would say, what they, you know, how they would move, what would be, be the feeling that they feel. So I'm sure that that is what happened in terms of actually living the life at that time and trying to see what the person was actually feeling, doing, thinking, and then progressing. So that would be wonderful. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uma, would you like to say a few words, Umadi? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I didn't carry my hearing aid, so I could hear most of it. Yeah. But, writer, so. but, but, Konarak has been such a source of inspiration. In fact, that was how I started. The reason why I started sculpting in glass, what was told in stone, was I have tried to recapture but another medium. Fantastic. And if those, anybody who wants to see it, it's on the net. Fantastic. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to looking, to reading the book. I'll come back to you, Molaida, in a second. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to say something? Okay, so I'm not giving you a choice. Before I turn to Parthada, these are the two who actually, in a way, put Mr. Gupta and his book uh, onto the map in, in Kolkata. So, Mona and Shushuta, quick one. Quick one from you and one from you. Um, we were very, very, very uh, thrilled uh, to launch uh, uh, 
Mr. Gupta's book because of the merit, uh, you know, the, uh, what should I say, the, uh, the standard of writing, the information, the knowledge. It was very, very engaging while, you know, one turned the pages uh, because I'm not a student of history, but there was so much to know, so much to learn, and so, so much to explore. And a very big thank you to uh, Julie, uh, Julie D and all the panelists at Starmark who had a wonderful discussion uh, on the book. And uh, we took a feedback from the audience, and they were pretty, pretty mesmerized by what Mr. Gupta had delivered uh, through the pages. So thank you very much, Julidi, for having us here today. And I want to thank Mr. Gupta for trusting us and giving us the book la the launch of the book. That was our 50th book launch, which happened at Starmark South City Mall. So like we, uh, we are very grateful to you. Thank you. Arthuda. Mr. Parthuranjan Das is a very well-known architect. He doesn't need an introduction, but I was praying he would be here to hear the discussion. He's the chair of the Bengal Club Book Subcommittee, Literary Subcommittee, and let's see what he has to say after he's heard. Uh, good evening. I haven't read the book, but uh, I can only talk about you know certain aspects of being an architect. I can talk about certain aspects of the Konark temple. Uh, uh, the, 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 the real temple has now vanished. I mean, if you look at the old drawings, old, old prints, and some old photographs, you'll see a part of it which existed when the British came here and then they started uh, sending people, you know, to sketch whatever remained uh, of the Konark Sun temple. You still see a part of the, you know, real portion, the real temple which is now vanished. What remains is the front portion, which we now see as the uh, Konark temple. And if you look at the geometry, there have been a number of analysis of the geometry of Konark temple, how it fits into a circle and how it's divided into several sections. It's absolutely brilliant. And to think that in those days when they did not have, Mr. Gupta would understand being an engineer, they did not have the system of producing working drawings. How did they do that? There is one little nugget that I want to share with you. I was just reading a book which I've got here by none other than Nirmal Basu. A, li a little background about Nirmal Kumar Basu. He was, after Madhav Desai passed away, he practically became the secretary of Mahatma Gandhi. But he was a no-nonsense man. And he decided that he was in Odisha for a long time. He was fascinated by the Konak temple. And he started studying the Konak temple in detail. He collected, you know, stories and artifacts and, you know, articles written by many people. And uh, the one uh, short, uh, this thing, incident about Nirmal Kumar Basu, just to prove that he was, you know, a no-nonsense man. That's why we respect what he's written here. Uh, when Gandhiji was here fasting on the 15th of August, 1947, when India became in independent is Haidari Manzil in Belaghata. Many of the Hindu community came to Gandhi to meet him, but he was behind closed doors. He didn't want to meet those people. Nirmal Basu was there as his secretary. So Nirmal Basu came and told Gandhi that, you know, these people are complaining that, you know, after everything has been decided, the country has been partitioned, then why are these riots happening? I mean, why, how do you, sort of justify that they have lost all their family members. Gandhiji told Nirmal Basu that you go out and you tell them on my behalf that their family members have laid down their lives for the independence of India. Nirmal Basu told Gandhi, India is already independent. I can't tell them. You go and tell them. This was Nirmal Basu. That's why I respect his book a lot because, you know, he after writing this book, he's gone to many experts and, you know, accepted corrections on his book. There is one incident he writes that, you know, Nandulal Bose was a very soft-spoken person. In fact, he didn't, never used to talk. But Nandulal Bose openly said that the artistic aspect of Konak temple is much better than Taj Mahal. 
he was refuted he wanted to say that in a gathering and he was like booed so he never repeated that again he said that the atmahal all that we see from an artist point of view is you know patterns on a flat piece of paper a flat piece of marble but if you look at the sculpture and the effort and what they have portrayed in konark is absolutely brilliant and perhaps the best in india that's what i wanted to say i really want to read the book and this is what i wanted to share with you well, i must confess that uh, Orissa has been unfamiliar territory for me. I've been there only once, but hearing this presentation, the first thing I will do is to get get the book and read it. So, um, if my co-hosts and our book club team, if you have any questions, this is your time to speak or forever hold your peace. You have the author in front of you. Otherwise, we will give the last word. Judy, Judy, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. That's why I gave you the one. <laughs> so I just go ahead. Go right ahead. You know, the uh, is there any significance in the in the sculptures of a, a lion subduing an elephant in, in, in the front of the south of the temple? An elephant. The elephant is thrown, and the lion is on top of it. I really didn't go deep into that, but this is a good question, and maybe someday I will find the answer. If I could uh, add a footnote, there is something similar in the main entrance of uh, the Jagannath Temple, which is called the Shingo Dwar. Yep. Yes. And in the Shingudua, you also have a lion trying to subdue a bull. And it is said that once you enter through the Shingudua, you take 21 steps, which is 21 aspects of physicality, which takes you to the, uh, which you have to shed to sort of do the darshan, whatever way you put it. So, with whatever is happening now to the Puri Temple, with the probability, you see, that is how. Your book is so immediately contextual in today's sort of, I don't want to use the word politics in a negative sense, but definitely it does have a meaning because you can't take that main door very easily, not without walking about one and a half kilometers. You have to take the Ashoda, which has another significance. So I'm sure there must be Ashoda some would be the horse. horse yes. yes. Trying to, it's, it's movement, you know, the lion, the horse. They signify some sort of movement. So that, I think, is more important. So what the people were thinking who were sort of building the temple is not just the static date. It's more than that. I think a point very well taken, um, Choitali. And once again, it reminds me of the importance of the power of Shakti. Because despite the male uh, divinities, there is a very important aspect of the female divinity, you know, the divine feminine, which I think we see in Bhairavi. Bhairavi. Yeah, which uh, it is only through Bhairavi that he attains that level of fortitude where he is healed from his, from his pain, from his disease, right? Disease kind of thing. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the aspect that also is uh, something that will be of interest to anybody is the, the floating deity in the Kunarak temple. Yes. You know, that, uh, the, you know, the knowledge of material sciences mm -hmm. and uh, applying it to uh, that aesthetic uh, use where you have something of that magnificence where the main deity is floating. And uh, the fa it's, it's our misfortune that we can't see it. It, uh, when it was built in its grandeur, it would have been really something yeah. stunning. You know, the fact that many of these Portuguese uh, colonizing ships were floundering on the rocks, mm. it seems that the temple may have had a defensive purpose. Was it built with uh, physical defense in mind? Or, or, was, that a, or, or was that a spin-off 
that are just occurred because they had used these uh, heavy magnets. No, it was very much so because initially from Banga, Bengal and from Anga, Bihar, the Muslims used to attack uh, Kalinga. And Kalinga didn't have so much of naval force. So they thought how to deter these kinds of attacks from the rivers or from the sea. So that was one of the reasons they used these magnetic rocks. But it seems uh, kind of dual purpose technology here. You know, you've got a temple which is using rocks to prevent it from sinking, but it's also, it's also a, a weapon. See, the rocks are already there. Rocks are already there near Konark. This is what my theory says. This is why many of the ships got destroyed. So, how to use those rocks? Now, the king has to think in terms. Maybe if it was not a temple, possibly he could have built a fort. But what he did was, he built a temple with the magnetic rocks. I mean, these are all theories. I won't even try to answer that, but all I can tell you is before, I think we call it a day and, and wrap it up, I'm, I'm, I'm reading, of course, I'm reading a book at the moment called Begamat Kaasu, which is the tears of the Begums. And this is actually the story of um, Zafar. Bahadur Shah Zafar, who is, who has to be relinquishing his throne because the British have come and thrown him off. And there you see that the entire thinking of monarchy was how, as Harish and, and uh, Mr. Gupta were, were talking about, the protection, so security and protection. These were the two most important aspects of ancient medieval uh, India. Today. Yeah, even today, even today, absolutely right. I just want to add two more things that there is a theory that the magnet was of 62 tons. So you can imagine the power of that magnet. So obviously that would, you know, attract all the ships which, uh, which had anchors and everything holding it together. The second thing is we know that there are seven horses representing the seven days of a week. What we don't notice at times is there are, out of seven, there are four horses on one side and three on the other side. And the theory is that it's, it's a chariot. It's designed as a chariot and it, because it's a sun temple and sun would move. And if you have a chariot with four horses on one side and three on the other side, they, it would move in an arc. In those days, how did they conceive that the sun has to move in an arc? We don't know yet. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to add a note to the discussion that last year, in the, in the month of April, I had been to the Temple of Konark. And I still remember our guide had shown it to us. Uh, uh, the face of a lady carved out on the stone and that lady was in all her ecstasy with a beautiful smiling face and uh, there was a lion's paw just above the lady's head. So the guide uh, explained it to us that uh, this particular figure actually has a deep-rooted philosophy and the philosophy is that uh, even uh, at danger, during danger, when someone is in crisis, terrible crisis, one has to keep uh, keep on the smiling face and one should remain happy in order to overcome that obstacle. And I will never forget that particular figure that has been carved out. A beautiful lady with curly hair and the lion's paw above her head. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to our author. I would definitely like to read the book, Mr. Gupta. And thanks to all the panelists and, of course, Judy. And uh, we have a, a bouquet of flowers.
will julie do the honors no, 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 please you come and give it to me uh, just a token of her appreciation sir thank you very much okay this is it you can keep it here you can keep the flowers here anyway thank you sir thank you so much thank you so much thank thanks for so this no actually we are making another room ready uh, the room number 6 which will be ready by 15th of april so i hope that all our next book club meets will be there in room number 6 which is a much better area for projection and for discussions like this thank you everybody without thank you i mean this would not have been successful thank you